So I, as I was walking over here today, I saw these Netflix signs um, for their new movie, Game Over Man, and I thought we should retitle this session. Um, Game Over Man. Um, uh, Tina Chen, former chief of staff to First Lady Michelle Obama. Um, and no Obama love in the audience? <laughs> Hello. In this day, we need some Obama love. Um, uh, but Tina uh, has uh, an identity so much bigger than uh, assisting the First Lady with her successful eight-year run. Um, she has been a longtime smart litigator lawyer, and since leaving the White House, she has specialized in uh, employment issues and sexual harassment and helping people and companies uh, deal with their issues and is a founder of the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund, Tina Chen, uh, law firm Buckley Sanders. I should make a pitch for your law firm. <laughs> um, Journey Small, it needs no introduction. Uh, an amazing actress and activist, uh, won an NAACP um, image award, I, which I actually just saw for Great Debaters, which is an amazing uh, um, film. Her roles in Friday Night Lights and in True Blood and so many others. We're so excited to have Journey uh, here with us. Thank you. Um, Fatima Goss Graves, the president of the National Women's Law Center, a long time, always give the Law Center some love. Um, they have done such amazing work for so many years in the streets, in the field. Uh, on sexual harassment, on women's issues, on so many of these issues, and we are so blessed to have Fatima now leading the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund. So um, we're gonna hear more about that uh, history too. But maybe, uh, Fatima, let's actually start with that history um, because obviously there's, uh, you know, I'm checking out the average age of the audience here. Um, this movement has been going on for so long. The problem of sexual harassment has existed for so long. Put this in a little bit of context for us in terms of the, how people dealt with it before, how people took it seriously, what kind of resources there were for women uh, or survivors, and we'll, we'll talk about the women versus men in a minute, but um, give, give, set the playing field for us. Sure, and I, and, and, it's interesting because to have harassment be a featured conversation at a, a place like South by Southwest, I think that that is some of the visibility and shift that we're seeing now. But, you know, harassment isn't a new idea, right? It is a long time problem that, has sh that shows up in every industry, in every workplace. And for, 50 years, it's been unlawful to engage in harassment at work because of a ban on discrimination in employment. And it was the mid 80s when the Supreme Court said, actually, yes, harassment is a form of sex discrimination protected. So just in case there's any confusion on the point, Supreme Court said it clearly then. And then, even still, if you fast forward, it wasn't uh, an area of the law that was well enforced. And there was, you know, at, when you do this work, there are sometimes these incredible movement moments. And so we are in the midst of one of those now, but many of us can remember back to a really critical movement moment with Anita Hill when she testified and we had as a country a really public conversation around harassment at that time and what it looks like uh, and following her really brave testimony when Anita was by herself and it seemed very lonely, thousands of people came forward at the first time. You saw the, e the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission which is the place where you have to go to file a harassment charge the EOC was saying, was receiving really high rates for the first time just on the question of harassment. So that was an important movement moment then where you saw employers take some steps and people start to come forward. And in that period, since that period of time in the early 90s and now, we haven't had a giant moment like the one we're in right now. And so, um Journey, you have been uh, involved with your peers in uh, Hollywood since the beginning um, of Time's Up, and uh, which 
really got its legs after the Harvey Weinstein uh, um, attention. Tell me how you got to this place and um, how you and some of your fellow uh, actresses and producers and writers and folks in the industry have really decided to kind of step up this way. You know, it's interesting. On a personal note, um, I've been thinking a lot about my own personal um, arc to, to this place. You know, I've been in front of the camera since I was 10 months old. <laughs> and um, my first experience with harassment happened before I was a teenager, you know, un unfortunately, on set, in the workplace. Um, and I realized how conditioned I, I have become to just accept it as a part of my job. Um, and not really feeling like there was any place I could go or anything I could do about it, you know, fellow actors, uh, ADs, directors, writers, like it really didn't matter. It just became, unfortunately, a, a condition to what I did. And I don't think any of us realized how conditioned we all have become to just accepting it. And, you know, with everything that started happening towards the end of last year with all of these brave women who started telling their stories, it, it became like a wave in all of us of like, oh my gosh, me too, this happened to you? And I think what we realized also is that we're oftentimes the only woman on set. We're oftentimes the only female you know, who has a speaking role in the scene. And so we live and work in such isolation that we haven't had the chance to be able to say, hey, this is happening to me as well. It's happening to you too. We, we you know, have been working in such like separate, you know, compartmentalized ways. And so when everyone just started telling their stories, we all realized this is unacceptable. And, you know, with what's happening in the admin current administration and the fact that he was even able to be elected, you know, it all started way before Harvey Weinstein. Um, but I think we all got together and was just like, enough is enough. We can't allow this to continue. And really this is about power and shifting the balance of power. There's been an imbalance of power. Unfortunately, our industry, like so many industries in our nation, have been run by straight white men. And that is unacceptable. It's been far too long where they've had the power. We are not in the boardrooms. We are not in the writers' rooms. We are not green lighting the films. And, and so until that changes, we're going to continue to be on the receiving end of this harassment because of the imbalance in power. Yeah, and Tina, that sort of sense of isolation that Journey describes as a woman in the um, in the room is quite common for women in a ton of different industries. Whether it's the woman on the assembly line plant in a sea of guys, and you've seen this all over. <laughs> yeah, big law firms, <laughs> right? Big law firms, big law firms <laughs> corporate boardrooms, um, and you know, for so many years, even though you know, as as Fatima says, we've been at this work, not just combating sexual harassment and employment discrimination for a half, you know, half a century. We've been trying to do diversity and inclusion work for half a century, and yet here we are in 2018 with 6.4 percent of Fortune 500 CEOs as women. Um, my favorite one is there are more men named John, Robert, William and David um, and on S&P, Standard & Poor's 1500, top 1500 companies in the country than there are women. So there are more men with those names than there are any women <laughs> on the boards of directors That's of crazy. the top 1500 companies in the country. Um, so we, are, we haven't made the progress. And what I often say in this moment where we're talking a lot about sexual harassment is that it's important to remember that sexual harassment is the tail end of the process. It is the symptom that happens when you don't have truly diverse workforces. So the thing we have to remember right now as we're talking a lot about how do we address sexual harassment and all of this really important work we are all doing with the Times Up Legal Defense Fund to combat sexual harassment is that we also have to pay attention to really doing all the things that keep women and people of color from advancing in companies. So all the structural barriers like no paid leave, like no flexible scheduling, 
no equal pay. We've got to break those down because when you have a truly diverse workforce that's led by women and people of color, in addition to white straight men um, and LGBT leaders, then then you will have a workplace that's safe and equitable for their workers. So we got to look at all of it. The, um, Fatima, talk a little bit about kind of how the um, that intersectionality plays out in some of the, you know, policy discussions that that you've had and um, what sort of, we're gonna get to the Legal Defense Fund in a, in a yeah. couple of minutes, but stay on this big picture for, for a minute about how you deal with that front end and what kind of work is being done there. Yeah, and I, I'm glad you raised that because I, I, you know, when we're talking about how do you both organize and do the work at the intersections of things like race and class and gender and gender identity, that means both understanding the commonalities, but also sometimes that means you have to look deep and center the experiences of those who are most vulnerable in a particular moment. And what has been interesting about the what Time's Up has revealed and the organizing behind Time's Up is both the commonality, but also the space to go deep. So one of the things, for example, is that we know is that in workplaces that where employment relations aren't that typical. They aren't as traditional. It's not clear exactly who your boss is. Maybe you actually are technically a contractor and not employed. That makes you vulnerable for a whole range of reasons. It's something that women working in low-wage jobs have been experiencing and dealing with for a long time and, and are not fully protected by our laws that prevent discrimination and are not fully where they need to be in terms of our labor laws, right? So this conversation, it turns out that's true in the entertainment industry too, right? Where you go from project to project and it's not a traditional employment relationship and a lot of these protections are contractual rather than you know, under our civil rights laws in the same way. And so when you actually take a moment and step back and are able to go deep on some populations that are especially vulnerable, it changes the policy solutions, right? It makes us understand that any solution to this problem has to think about the fact that workers who are uh, domestic workers and home care workers aren't fully protected under the law or the relationship between people who have to uh, rely on tips to increase their wages and the inherent uh, vulnerability that that brings in the relationship to harassment. So if we really are gonna do this in an intersectional place, it's gonna require us to go deep and, and really center the experiences of women of color, of women who are in low income jobs as well. And can I add just, because since we're at South by Southwest, gig economy. Yeah. yeah. All right, you know, I mean, the labor laws that Fatima referred to that were written 50 years ago do not account for the gig economy. They don't account for people who are working out of their own homes, you know, who are doing contract work, who are driving their car, you know, who are doing the errand thing, you know, on gigs. And if they get harassed right now, there's no protections. There's no protections for them. And that's what we're finding, too, as people come forward in the, for the Legal Defense Fund is, like, a lot of times there's actually not a solution because the laws really haven't caught up to the way work gets done right now. And so is there, are, are, there are people now working on how you update these laws, um, and both at the state level and at the federal level. And in this environment, do you feel optimistic about that? Um, is there something folks in this audience should be doing and thinking about? Well, there? these things aren't gonna happen on their own, right? But. We actually have a window we haven't had in a really long time in terms of really moving more meaningful policy. Uh, you know, right in October and November, we were inundated with requests from states who were saying, we feel like we need to do something. Uh, we were thinking just introducing a bill uh, that suggests training. And, and we were like, that now is not the time for you to think small, right? Now is the time for you to come bigger and bolder, and there is that opportunity, but it's gonna take continued and sustained 
pressing, and I'll just tell one quick story, and that is one of the things that has been revealed over the last few months is that our policymakers have these absurd systems themselves. That's true at the state houses and true in Congress where they basically made it so it was almost impossible to complain about discrimination yep. against policymakers. And getting them to fix themselves, it turns out, is a tough thing to do. Really? <laughs> Except there's one thing you all can do to fix themselves. Vote. This is, a, this is an election year, guys. And I'm not telling you how to vote. It is no matter what you do. I just want you to make sure you do vote this year. This is one of the reasons why it's important, is to address these issues. Yeah. So I, I'm optimistic, and I'm also optimistic because we also, again, see a lot of women running this year in numbers like we have not seen. You know, this is the year of women. Yeah. Um, Journey, I found it so powerful, um, and uh, you, you might be too modest to say this, but people should understand the um, when the women of Hollywood got connected to uh, after after their initial meetings, there was outreach from the farm women farm workers um, to women of Hollywood, essentially saying, "We support you. We've had this experience. We are all sisters." And I found it so, uh, having worked in the entertainment industry for many years in the music business, where you know frequently. Um, people were cynical about sort of the cause of the moment. What what I found really um, heartwarming was how serious the women in Hollywood took the alliance with other working women, with low-wage working women, and how that has really fueled so much of the, the work. It wasn't, oh, it started, it wasn't it, just a red carpet yeah. appearance, folks. This is like meeting after meeting, really understanding the problems that women in low-wage uh, jobs have. I, I'm so glad you mentioned that. That letter was a catalyst for us. I mean, for one, to to feel the sense of solidarity with our sisters across industries, for them to reach out and say, we see you, and we know what that feels like. It empowered us so much, and, and it, it empowered us, but also gave us this responsibility to do something with this platform. Right. You know, there's a there's a privilege and there's a burden that we hold in that people pay attention to the Natalie Portmans of the world, to the Tracy Ellis Rosses of the world. You know, when they walk a red carpet or when they do an interview, they have a responsibility to make sure that what they are saying is is a validity, you know? Um, and in this moment, I think we just all felt so empowered and privileged that they would reach out across industries to us. I mean, what a gesture, you know, of, of solidarity. And it just united us in a way with our sisters in this country, across, well, not just this country, across the globe, really, yeah. to, to understand, you know, we're in this together. And the patriarchy will fall because we're in this together. Mm -hmm. And absolutely. Yeah. Down with the patriarchy, okay? <laughs> For sure. <laughs> it's over, man. Game over. Um, the, and the other piece that um, was uh, powerful in that, um, because so, you know, majority of the farm workers were Latina, um, that intersectionality and um, inclusion became sort of, uh, a, a, a you know a watchword at the outset of this, Absolutely. as opposed to kind of a catch up like it did in prior feminist movements. Yes, and I think we we are trying to learn so much from the past, and what you know pitfalls not to to fall into what mistakes not to make because movements that's, in the past okay, have you absolutely you know unfortunately been co opted, and women of color are in the center hub of Time's Up. There is no Time's Up without women of color. There is no Time's Up without trans women. There is no Time's Up without women of, you know, different uh, abilities. And so we are so focused on that. You know, there is a working group called Woke, <laughs> Women of Color. And, you know, one thing we are heavily working on is making sure that at every single step Time's up is thinking about intersectionality and how 
how the workplace is different for uh, for different women. You step into a, a room as Laverne Cox, a beautiful trans woman. How is that room perceiving her? And what challenges is she stepping into? That is a different challenge that I will never know. I will never know the challenges that Laverne Cox experiences. And so how can we be sensitive and address her needs as well? And so those are the things we're challenging. And listen, we're not perfect. We're only, you know, two months. <laughs> we've been after this two for two months. months. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we, we, we need staff. We've got a long ways to go. But, you know, that's that's our that's our mission. And um, that sort of leads to the um, uh, founding of the Legal Defense Fund which was intended to be for all survivors. And um, Tina, talk a little bit about that early philosophy. And then Fatima, I want you to give everybody an update on how the fund is doing, what's happening, some of the stories we're hearing. Yeah. So really the impetus, the early impetus, um, right when the first meetings were happening around Time's Up and people in the entertainment industry were speaking out, like these brave women that Journey was talking about who came forward in the early days. Well, one of the things that started to happen to some of those women who were talking about experiences long past but involving rich and powerful men is that the lawyers for those rich and powerful men started writing those women directly and threatening them. It's, I call it legal bullying. I mean, they were really saying, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're coming after you. And um, I'm a lawyer, so I will say this on behalf of my profession. I actually looked at the first letter thinking, oh, that's got to be unethical. Like, no, it's not. It was not unethical. It was right up to the line because the lines are pretty far for lawyers on how far they can go. And the only way, therefore... Well, in real people's terms, it's unethical. Yeah, it's Maybe <laughs> it's not against the bar rules. <laughs> right, right. Right. Fair. Right. <laughs> but so the only way to get people help when they're subject to that kind of bullying, that's meant, let's be real, what that's about. That's about silencing mm -hmm. folks. That's about allowing this to keep going, you know, keep... It's what's gone on for years. It's why this has been underground and people have suffered in silence for so long. And the only way to put a stop to that is to make sure they have lawyers, that everybody has a lawyer who needs a lawyer. And you know that was the impetus right away because a lot of times if you don't have a good claim for wages because you got fired, and let's be clear, the laws are tough because the statutes of limitation, the requirement is very short, like 180 days for you to file a claim. And if this is something that happened to you years ago and you've left the business, but it is, just been, it has made you leave your job and it's it's eating at your soul. Then, and you speak out, you can get sued for defamation and that's what was happening. And then you are on your own to pay your legal bills. And that's why we needed to get folks help. Um, the other thing we also learned along the way too is that even for people who can make a claim for lost wages or in a job right now, if you're a low wage worker, it's really hard to find a lawyer who will take your case. Because although the lawyers can get lawyer's fees um, for, through some of these laws, if, you're, if your damages are so low because your wages are low, then the lawyers don't take it because it's not economical. And these are lawyers, in fairness to the lawyers, these are a lot of lawyers who do great work for workers, but they are in small firms and they don't have a lot of money and they can't do this. So we've you know uncovered a huge group of people just thousands now of people who have not been able to have lawyers in all these years that we've had employment discrimination law to combat this. Um, and that's how we started the fund. Now I will say one of the great things about the women of Hollywood is that these women who were coming together to talk about what was going on in their industry last fall wanted to make sure that this Time's Up Legal Defense Fund was predominantly for low wage workers. This was something using their platform, your celebrity, your speaking out on the red carpet, you know, taking that on to make sure we had the resources um, to get lawyers, especially for low-income women who can't afford it. That's right. And that's been a working philosophy. So then um, Tina had the idea to go to our sister Fatima, uh, who was running the National Women's Law Center and had a legal referral network that wasn't paying for legal fees, but had contacts across the country and talk them into taking this on. Yeah. 
which was not an easy thing. Um, because I think organizationally was, disruptive. Well, let's and I think I, I think it was about Thanksgiving but, when I went to her and I said, oh, also, "Oh, by the way, we're going to announce it on January yeah. first. <laughs> you have like four weeks to decide." But it was also um, it was never an issue of will. I'll, I'll say that it was just a huge undertaking, and we are all so grateful that the National Women's Law Center has stepped up. Um, and now I, I heard you describe it yesterday as building the plane while you were flying the plane. I think we're more now flying than building, which is great. Um, but why don't you give folks some uh, instances of what's happening there? Sure. I mean, it's extraordinary to think it has only been two months yeah. that all of this has happened, that uh, two months ago people weren't saying time's up, right? Uh, and let me and just say, it wasn't like, this wasn't reinventing the wheel. There is nothing like this in the yeah. country. There was no place to go. Right. To it, give money to that was already doing it. Nobody was doing it. Right. There wasn't, and there wasn't an off the shelf model. Right. And we knew we had to do this right and with care and, and to ensure that we met the goals uh, of, of really making sure that especially workers in some of the lowest wage jobs could actually get connected to attorneys, that we had enough attorneys in the network, that we were actually meeting the needs. Uh, and so we launched over two months, a little over two months ago, we have had contacts from over 1,900 people in that time period. And I, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of comparison because in October and November, we thought we were getting an elevated number of intakes around harassment. We were saying there's something going on here that was more like 30, 40 a week. So to just you know talk about the scale, and w the reason we have had such a shift in this scale is absolutely the attention and the awareness and a different understanding that there will be people there who will have their back. So, so that has been the move. We also have had hundreds of new attorneys join our network. We have over 500 attorneys who uh, are willing to provide free legal consultations and take on cases. And in that period, uh, the money that has been raised has been tremendous. It's been tremendous in the amount. There's over $21 million that has been raised. It has been tremendous in the number of donors where there's been over 20,000 different people who have donated in every state in this country and in countries around the world. Right, from $5 to a million dollars. From five, I mean, if yeah. someone is giving $5, that may be all they can give, but what they're saying is I wanna be a part of this. I wanna be a part of this movement. I wanna do what I can to help. And, and so you have this energy and the 21 million, is not enough, which is a controversial thing to probably say, but it's not enough because anyone who's ever actually needed legal services knows that it's extremely expensive. Which is why this has never been done before, because yeah. it's taking it on a big thing. Yeah. Well, and also you have to think about the predators that these these survivors are having to take on. They have mountains of legal firms behind them, and they have endless money stream to be able to employ these lawyers. So yes, it sounds like a lot of money to say we've raised $21 million, but that is not necessarily a lot of cases that could cover that. Well, we need, we, we need to continue to grow the fund, for sure. We need to continue to recruit additional attorneys to be a part of the network and take these cases. And all of that, as you say, is a part of ensuring that we are armed and ready to battle back against uh, the people who are on the other side who would like to continue the silencing and pushing this issue into the shadows and making it so more people don't really come forward. Because they'll wait us out, right? I mean, they've got the resources to wait us out if we don't match the resources, you know, and don't and don't match it with our will to stay on. So one of the things we were talking about, what can we ask folks to do, you know, um, here at South by Southwest? A couple things. One is continue to raise money for this. You know, hold a fundraiser. You know, hold, and it can be both an awareness raising event and fundraising event because we need to grow the resources, and then we also need to get the word out to folks who might need help that there's a place to go especially low-income workers. And that's something the South by Southwest community can really be helpful to us on. The other thing that the fund has uh, is doing and is an early pledge from the start is that much of the bullying ends up taking place in the, in the media. So there's a silencing uh, that's beyond just a, a quiet legal threat. And so the um, 
vision of the fund is we're not just going to help you legally, we're going to help you PR-wise. So in addition to having, you know, hundreds of lawyers volunteer, we now have multiple PR firms across the country who are also working with lawyers and taking on these cases so that the stories can get out there. And that is not just, you know, the famous media stories. That means when a plant worker in Lexington, Kentucky is um, uh, um, challenged by a, um, you know, a supervisor, we want to, we're going to go into that local community and we are going to do as much as we can in that local um, media market to make this be an important local issue. And that is something that I think that from a, from a combining the PR and the legal really calls out behavior in, in, an, in an effective way as, as we can make it. Although, in addition, to be clear, is is it's all the it's all the woman's choice. It's all the victim's choice. Oh, of choice. course. No, but right. and, which is what very you important. know Hillary is really good we're at. We're not creating doing. We're not creating media stories to. No, I mean, and what and from the beginning, whether you sue it's to help. I mean, the lawyers are also there to help just advise people too on yep. what what your rights are, and nobody's pushing anybody to take to file a case they don't want to file. If they want to negotiate a settlement with their the, with their company, we'll help them do that. You and know, and many is, people are you know just seeking anonymity here, but but other people want to have their stories told. We we recently had a um, a food service worker in Pennsylvania who uh, had an experience with the chef and right at at the hotel she was working at and wanted that story told and has been very public about it and it has changed the environment in that small um, uh, community in that place of work. And I think, I, I think the storytelling component is ultimately going to be really important whether people want to be public facing mm -hmm. or not. Part of what we're doing is tracking the trends as well. And that's what's letting us know that uh, there are dozens of uh, occupations that we've already heard from, that we've heard from women in retail and restaurants, working in hotels, uh, working in prisons, active duty military. I mean, it really has ranged across C-suite and some of the lowest wage workers. So it reinforces that what we already knew was that harassment was an everywhere problem. But here, what has been interesting is that we're also able to track some of the common trends that people face, right? In almost all of these settings, what immediately happened was someone tried to retaliate against them. Right. So I want to open up for questions. So start to think about, please, we really, questions, comments, we really want to hear from you. Um, we have a, a quite a bit of time left for, for audience conversation. Um, while you're thinking about that, let me just, uh, and I think you line up right here. While you're thinking about that, I, I, people ask me all the time, well, do you get men calling? Um, and what's the situation with men? You should just know, obviously, the Legal Defense Fund is open to, to, um, to men, to, um, uh, to anyone, uh, any, any gender identity. Ed, but of the first 1,500 calls, we got 25 of them were men. So you can see the scale. Maybe some of that is that men are less likely to seek help. But maybe um, it's also dick of the problem. So we frequently say she and woman when we connect with survivors just because that's where the data is going. Yeah. Hi, I'm sorry I have this up. I'm not really a social media person, but I have uh, viewers from around the world uh, with me on this campaign that I launched on International Women's Day. Great. Um, I was sick and tired of seeing what's going on. I am a personal victim of Me Too multiple times, unfortunately, um, which inspired me to start a campaign because um, I was violated and uh, almost blackmailed to have my naked body shown. I was drugged and um, taken advantage of by a friend and th two other people. and. Um, because of you guys and what you've done. Sorry, it made me emotional. It's okay. Mm. <laughs> the reason why I'm here. Give some love. Give her some love. Yeah. You are so brave. You are so brave. I'm doing this for women everywhere because nobody should have to feel how I felt, how any of us have felt when we've been violated. So what I'm doing is actually I started a campaign that launched around the female form the body, it's inclusive for everybody, LGBTQ plus community um, included. Um, basically what we're doing is the hashtag is this one's for me and is women taking back our power. 
so that we're not oppressed anymore, so that we're not abused anymore, so we're not discriminated anymore, so that when we go in our office, we don't have to like work so hard to get in a place that we deserve to be in because we are so powerful and we have so many stories to tell and we are just so talented, multi-talented as women. We can do anything. And um, basically what we're trying to do is disrupt and dismantle the system and build it up with a different narrative with us collectively trying to change the world and show the world that this is our story and you cannot dictate how we look, how we act, what we're given, what we're allowed. Like we literally, I was just here a second ago, listen to uh, Barry and uh, he was just talking about breaking down brick walls and that that's what we have to do. This is, I don't know if anybody can feel it, but there's a huge transition going on in the world right now. And we are, uh, we have the ability right now that we have to stand it just like our, our mothers before us where they felt this feminist movement going on. If you don't stand at that time, the change cannot be as big as it could be. Um, I have a lot to say, but I'm gonna wrap it up because Everybody here has something important to say, but first I would love to connect with all of you to see how I can uh, make this um, movement even bigger. We just started two days ago. We have around 2,000 followers, 5,000 people loading in, uh, 100 people that have already participated in our movement. Um, you can check it out at the Boo Book, at the Boo Book. But um, I had an important question for you, and my mind is going a million miles a minute. Um, basically, what, do you, what advice do you have for me trying to make a change, trying to not just listen and and talk but walk and like from your perspectives of as active women in the industry uh, who are making a global change what advice do you have for me so i can really catapult this and take this far so that women in india who are getting acid burned and and there's people from all across the globe that are being oppressed that can can hear us speak and how do we push that it's a it's a perfect question first of all thank you for everything you're doing thank you and if you if you do not control access to your body, you control nothing. Like, that is step number one. Um, ideas on... Well, what the first thing I just want to say is you're doing it. Yeah. I, I mean, and, and thank you for what you're doing, because that has been this opening we have right now. People have to enter it from their stories, their experiences, and we need to tie it together. Mm -hmm. Because I agree that this is not, like, typical business and at the end of this, I think we are going to be in a different place, especially if all of us work together to turn up that volume and 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 shift to that next phase. So it it sounds to me like you are doing it. I, I, I would just add anymore. one thing I'd add is 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 look for others because there are a lot of folks out there doing it. This is sort of the lesson from Time's Up. I want you to learn is we weren't going to start this a new thing all on its own. We went to a 45-year-old women's rights organization, the National Women's Law Center, and that has been the key because they were already there. And in all of these, there's already somebody there to be your partner and to work with you. And too often in the women's movement, I feel like we're fragmented and we get separated from one another. And I want to give a shout out to my United States of Women folks right here, Jordan Brooks and Taylor Barnes. Raise your hands. One of the things we did at the Obama administration was start United State of Women through the White House Council of Women and Girls. It's continuing. The next national summit will be May 5th and 6th in Los Angeles. Jordan and Taylor are here. That is what United State of Women is about, is to connect. Everybody's doing work in all of these spaces for women and girls. Thank you. It was an honor to be here. Thank you. And, Thank um, you. I, I just want to say also, I am over, I'm sorry for collaboration over competition all the way. I'm working with everybody to piggyback on top of this so that people can find the avenue that they need to find healing. So thank you. And I'll be in contact with you guys. I hope you see my email, info at the Don't Don't dismiss it, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first, I just wanted to thank you all for coming to South By. I live and work here in Austin, and I'm glad that y'all were able to come here and have a nice, diverse panel to touch on this subject. Um, I'm a local, my name is Christina Miller and I'm a local anti-violence uh, educator and advocate and I work at um, Safe Alliance which provides resources and support uh, for victims of sexual and domestic violence and for those of you who um, aren't from around here I wanted to share the hotline number that's 24 hours um, in case you need it which of course you can find online 512-267-7233. Uh, um, but yeah, just Google Safe Alliance if anything happens to you or a loved one, 
Um, all the services are free. Um, and I hope that you're able to reach out if that's something that you'll need. Um, I have a question around um, the backlash that y'all have been getting. I feel like October and November, there's just this huge surge of um, victims coming forward. But I feel like now it's hit a point where uh, those of us who aren't very invested in this movement um, are sort of pushing back, especially as their faves are being named as serial abusers. And um, a lot of men in particular are paying lip service, wearing the Time's Up pin, who um, aren't really doing the necessary work to um, lift this up. And I just wanted to hear what y'all think around that, um, around that subject. It, it's a really good question, and we've all we've seen it in multiple places. Whether it's you know, the you know guys in the workplace breathing a sigh of relief, or you know fighting back and suggesting that women shouldn't be believed. Yeah. Um, we we've seen it in all sorts of industries, and I think, you know, the my personal view is the counter um, uh, action to that is just vigilance. Like we are not going away, yeah. and this is not a this is not a moment in time. This is a you know this is a, a movement, a movement forever cause, and and so, um, it you know I think it is up to all of us to make people believe that that we're not going to forget about this. This is not like a cause celeb. Yeah. This is a systemic, significant balance of power problem that took you know a hundred years to get us here and may take you know several more to get us out. Thank you. Sorry. Well, the only other thing that I'd ask was two weeks into the media stories in October, reporters were asking me when the backlash was coming and, and it, when is this ending? So people were ready for it to end before it had even really begun. And if, as someone who's been doing this work for so many years, you know that part of it is doing the work and continuing to do it, as you say, being vigilant. Yep. Uh, so the backlash will come and we'll be ready. The other thing that we get, just to, um, I'll say is, you know, sometimes reporters ask me, well, where's the rehabilitation for these guys? Where do, when do they get forgiven? What about the support of victims? And, you know, that, that's what I'm saying. It's like, that's not our job to forgive them or rehabilitate them. Yeah. That's up to them to figure out what they can do next. Right? Like, that, that's, not, that's not our job. Our job is that there has been systemic abuse and we have to support survivors. And if, if you know, people who have been abusers wanna, wanna get on with their life and, and make amends. Then do it. Make amends. <laughs> no one's stopping them. And then I just had one quick question. Quick question. Uh, uh, so April is Sexual Assault uh, Awareness Prevention Month and I was wondering if y'all were uh, gearing up to do specific pro programming for that month. More to come. We gotta get on that. Right? <laughs> More to come. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. So Thanks for your work you're doing here. Hi, uh, my name is Mackenzie, and I'm 18 years old. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm I'm really young. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being here, Mackenzie. That's yeah, great. this um, this is my first year at South by, and I wanted to start with kind of a story because I feel like a lot of this conversation so far has been focused on the workplace, and that's super important. But um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about harassment in schools, yeah. and because I, I think that's important conversation to highlight as well. So. Like, when I was 14, I was on the school bus, and I had to sit next to this guy who was making nonstop comments about me, and mainly about me giving him a blowjob and being very touchy. And when I reported that, it was mainly like a, well, those comments are crude, but he was joking. And it was more of a, like, a slap on the wrist and kind of a get over it situation. And I was wondering what your advice is for young women who are going through this in a, in a society that seems so focused on the idea that boys will be boys, and that's just something that you have to deal with. And so especially for young people who are so scared to speak out in, in school systems, I was wondering what your advice was for that. So Fatima and I can jump right into this. So to be clear, time's up. We've been focused on the workplace because one of the things we say in time's up is, you know, there are, we can do a lot of things, but we need to focus. And so time's up has been focused on the workplace. However, 
one of the things Fatima and I have spent a lot of the last eight years doing is working on um, sexual harassment in schools, specifically around Title IX. Title IX is the federal law that bars sex discrimination in federally funded schools, which applies all the way down to kindergarten schools, all the way up through colleges. And it's most frequently known for the, it's the vehicle by which we have got more women playing sports. But it also, as we made clear in the Obama administration, in a letter that um, Secretary Duncan wrote to all of the schools in 2011, um, it, federal law requires schools to address sexual assault and sexual harassment of students. That it is illegal for them not to have systems in place that support victims, right, and hold perpetrators accountable. Um, and we did a lot of work around that, and the Women's law, National Women's Law Center has been representing a lot of victims, you know, who are, whose schools are not doing their job. But here's the thing. Um, the current Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos, yeah. has already announced and is going through a process of rescinding our letter on sexual assault. She did it after she only met with you know um, perpetrator representatives and not victims. And Fatima, you should jump in because the National Women's Law Center, along with others, is suing the S Secretary DeVos right now about that act. Yeah, I just to add on to that because here's a concrete way people can get involved. We did file a suit challenging the Department of Education and, and the Secretary for rescinding the guidance and putting out confusing guidance to schools that essentially said do what you like. Uh, there is going to be a formal comment period that is scheduled as soon as this month. And that is an opportunity for people to weigh in and tell the Secretary of Education what it is that you expect your schools to do, to tell stories. And, uh, you know, it's important. I, I urged, and many of us urged, uh, the Secretary to actually spend time meeting with survivors, to go around the country and hear their experiences with their schools. They chose not to do that. They chose not to do, frankly, the deep work that the Obama administration had done, where they were listening to people in a range of ways. So we're in the middle of a really important conversation and fight on that. And then the last thing I'll just say is that uh, because of the attention and awareness, I think, from Time's Up, we have been hearing from more people who are coming in and also talking about their experiences of harassment and violence in schools. Uh, we are able to connect people through the broader legal network for those types of cases for attorneys. So people, if they come in and have concerns around sex discrimination and sexual harassment in other settings, we're still able to connect them and give them attorney information. And I, I would say one more thing, which is um, you stay strong because all of the rules um, coming from Washington may not you know, uh, uh, affect how somebody feels every day on the school bus. And we have allowed social media to be weaponized against um, girls for too long. And we should all be doing everything we can to push back on social media, to use our community resources, to build our, 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 our friends you know, lists, to, to, to push back on, you know, boys that do this. And that nothing will substitute from that peer pressure. And, and, and st so stay at it. Stay well, at and it. One, other, one other resource for you is a movement, is a student-led movement, which you can join, to do exactly that, to build a culture called It's On Us. So it's on us.org, and it is led by students, you know, started in colleges, but it's going down to high schools right now, and it's also we're building It's On Us communities. So it's on us.org, and it is intended to draw yep. boys in to change culture as well as young women, um, and it's enormously powerful, and that will find, you'll find a community that will help and will be supportive there. Thanks. Thanks for being here. I just wanted to say thank you and that you guys are inspirational to women of all Well, ages. you're an inspiration to us. We are so glad you're here. Thank, thank you. you. Right. Thanks. Hi. Um, first, I want to thank all you guys for the great work you're doing. Um, I had a question about uh, a lot of the stories that we've heard, especially the more high-profile ones, involve NDAs. And I'm wondering what you guys see the future looking like with NDAs. Are those still going to be a part of like employment contracts and because I think a young woman given an NDA to sign at a job, she might not have the wherewithal to think it through and you know, you just want to a job. 
And so what would your advice to be, be to women who are confronted with an NDA at work? Well, it's a it's sort of a complex issue yeah. that you know some of it is easy like the people who are making you sign NDAs just to work yeah. at a job before you even know what it is you may want to actually disclose in the future, right? You you, you Don't may sign that. Right. <laughs> so I I actually think we're going to see some important shifts on that front. But I have to say a number of the clients we represent, they want some confidentiality. Mm -hmm. And so I, I have avoided saying never in no circumstance should you have an NDA because I, I, I think it's important that it be survivor mm -hmm. driven and a tool that people but, but can But clarify, have. they want confidentiality maybe after there's been a, an incident and they've right. maybe gotten um, you know, whole or some financial settlement, they don't want their details known. As a, it can be important as a part of the resolution. That's empowering for them as opposed to a condition of employment right. or something yeah. like that. No, that's absolutely right. The employment contracts that say, if you work here, you can never ever tell anybody what happened, even if it's terrible, or if you work here, you must arbitrate always all the things, no matter what it is. You might have to sit across the table from your abuser. Those, I think, we're gonna see major movement on. I just caution people from being yeah. over, over broad and saying no NDAs um, ever. Cool. Is that helpful? Yes, good, thank you. Hi, thank hey. you so much for being here today. You guys are all incredible. Um, I work in advertising and we've seen recently with you guys coming out in Hollywood, it's definitely like, I think inspired a movement in, among women in advertising to really come forward. I, you guys probably seen the news, a lot of like, CEOs and creative directors are um, losing their jobs because people are finally exposing them, which is awesome. Right. Um, one thing that I've experienced at least is like HR uh, tends to cover, you know, the company's ass instead of like helping you. Right. Um, and you hear things like, oh, well, like that's only happened to you once, like wait till it happens like four times and then we have an issue, like, oh, maybe they don't know that what they're doing is wrong. Um, so now we're seeing like trends like uh, Madison, Diet Madison Avenue and Cindy Gallup where you can like report anonymously and they'll be your voice for you and it's been like really effective and I'm just wondering like your guys' thoughts on like that route versus getting a lawyer. Well, if you have an individual claim, says the non-lawyer, um, you really should, uh, if, if you really should call the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund and see whether you have rights and something can be done. There. Industries need change and leadership needs pressure. Um, keep your eyes out for um, a community of women in advertising aligning with Time's Up over the next um, several days. But the um, but as an individual, you, you have rights and you shouldn't have to wait for a company to decide when there has been enough of a problem. Like, you know, you can stand up for yourself. Well, and I, I caution you that, that sometimes the, as I, the the time limits for filing claims can be very short. Right. Mm -hmm. So although I I understand the sentiment on having external you know ways to report if you if you can't do it in, in internally. When I've been advising clients, quite frankly, I've been telling them to have more routes internally than to go external because it's better if you can. Get and you, people should have routes to go that don't affect their job, like you know, not just to their direct supervisor, but to somebody, and not just HR, because one of the things we know about human resource departments is they are really usually over to the side in a company. They are not the decision makers. Their job really is to protect the company. That's what they've been told their job is. Um, and I think you're going to see a change in companies realizing we've got to treat these employment issues, when I tell companies, you gotta treat them as seriously because your employees are your investment the same way the new technology you wanna implement is an investment. And you've gotta pay attention to it as, as closely and with as many resources and in, in, the, in, in, the, in the CEO's office, you know, um, as high up as it can go, not just off to the side. Yeah, we have a couple, time for a couple more questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, how are you? Um, so you mentioned that about 6% of females are CEOs or something like that, known for 500. So I actually worked for a very large tech firm for many years. Um, and I have many great female bosses who just got tired of fighting, you know, and, and I'm, I'm not even getting to harassment, although, I mean, probably it happened too. Uh, luckily, not to me on that firm. <laughs> but, uh, but I mean, it's just fighting the fight. As I said, the people who, the good people end up leaving. And I mean, right now there's more females, engineers, uh, graduating from college than male. Yep. 
I mean, first, of course, they first have to go the first hurdle and get in the job. But then once you're in the job, you still have to keep fighting the fight, you know? And I, and I know, I mean, it's just, you know, so tiring. Actually, I end up quitting, too. And now I'm in a much better place than I was before. I mean, but, you know, just last night, actually, um, and I don't care if the person is here, but somebody made a comment and basically shut me down in a social conversation, you know, uh, because he wasn't getting all the attention that he wanted, I guess. I was still in the spotlight. And I mean, it's still part of me, still have a doubt that was I, you know, being to something? But I was like, no, you know, it's just, but anyway, I don't know if this is really a question, but um, I mean, I, what is there for us to do? You know, just keep fighting, just keep like staying on jobs that, you know, where people, and, and especially in the tech sector, where, you know, the majority are male and, you know, what do you do? At some point, actually, you also want to have a family or you have a family, you don't have good maternity leave, you know, mm -hmm. so. This is the point I was making earlier, which is this is a, sexual harassment's the tail end of a whole process that we've got to attack on all fronts around building diverse workforces. So it's all those things. You're struggling, you're fighting the fight, and you're not even getting paid the same. So of course people give up and they and, and, and they need to leave for their families. And we don't have flexible work schedules and we don't have paid leave. Um, and we have to fight on all of those fronts and support one another. Um, and it, we really need people to stay in the jobs and companies are starting to realize that I will say on the you know hopeful note you know one of the things I observed when we were in the White House were companies who came forward who really did want to help they, they see the data that's coming out now right that more diverse companies are more successful we're, we have an increasing body of, of economic data that shows that actually it's profitable to have a more diverse workforce it's not just like the right thing to do it's actually the profitable there, thing there to was do. a McKinsey study that came out of um, two months ago that basically said that companies with more diversity at the top have a 15% right. um, revenue differential at, um, from other companies. Get those right. statistics out there more. <laughs> yeah. Thank well, you. and so we're gonna, we've got to fight on all of those fronts. Thank you. Stay with it. Hi, ladies. My name is Liza Monet Morales, otherwise known as XOXO Liza. Two Zs, please. XOXO. Yeah, XOXO Liza. Uh, Tina, it's so great to see you. I was at United States of Women, and I was a, an agent of change, and I was at South by South Lawn, and really just using my platform and my voice, both as an actor and TV host, and last year as a best-selling author to bring on my community to what we're doing. I, too, am a survivor of both sexual molestation and workplace harassment, and it's something that I've been very open about with my community. And what's been interesting since this whole Time's Up movement is so many of my Latinas uh, have come forward to say, this is what you've been talking about. Oh my gosh, this is so great. I do have those stories. But one thing in our culture that we really have is pena, which is a shame over talking about anything. It's very deeply rooted. And I would love to definitely collaborate and be involved with the event uh, in, that you guys have coming back in LA. But I would also love to know what resources you guys have in Spanish or you ladies have in Spanish, because that is something, and if I could be of service in any way to be a part of the women of color, the woke group, because that is a need that I am seeing and I can be that bridge. Uh, and I'm getting inundated with like 600 emails a day of like, where do we go in questions in Spanish? And is the fund available for us? I'm like, I don't know. Let me find out. Sure. So, yeah. Um, the fund is available for you. But okay. Journey, there is more conversation about doing more in yes, Spanish. Yes, no, absolutely. And we'd love to, you know, talk more about collaborating. But yes, that is one of, the, one of our focuses is making sure when we say inclusive, it is inclusive. So we're going to have to really work on all those facets that you're talking about. Again, we're so young, so bear with us. I'm yes. sorry, you know, like, you know, but but the fund is absolutely open to everyone. And so please tell all of your followers to yeah. contact the fund if they need help. Are the resources available in yeah. Spanish? Because yeah. I've been trying to figure out if I need to translate it or what So we have like. translators available if, if someone needs it. And so as soon as, it, you know, one of the early questions, that's one of the things that people ask. And so that's already built in. And we are hearing from people who speak Spanish, but other languages right. as well. OK, perfect. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Hi. Hi, I'm Shorty. <laughs> um, uh, I came from Brazil. I am a filmmaker in Brazil. And especially since the Me Too and the Time's Up campaign, in Brazil, in our industry, it's not an industry, but it's 
more like a scene, film scene. Um, we women are speaking out about harassment and rape and etc. in social media. But uh, since we don't have legal advice or any advice, we are not saying the name of the, the people right. who are yeah. harass harassing. So these guys are still working and especially working and uh, taking the, the jobs of women that will not take a job if that guy is there. So, so what we are doing is that we post on the social media. Uh, I, I'm a director. I will not work with a DP that raped my friend. And then a person who sees that say, okay, who is that DP? And I had to say on private his name. So that's what we are doing to, to, to make like to, to, to trash these guys. <laughs> I don't know what to say, sorry. Uh, so what would be your advice for us to make a step forward? So th there are um, uh, multiple countries right now that are kind of reaching out to Time's Up at, ba based in LA um, to create kind of unique organizations for countries based on your laws and based on your um, uh, rules. Um, Time's Up London just recently started. But I think there are something like 35 different countries that are now in touch with Time's Up about how can, how can they start organizations in their own country. So stay tuned or start it yourself if well, nobody in Brazil say. is doing it because it's, it's well needed and um, all of the tools to start it are right there in your head and um, we'll do whatever we can to, to help. Yeah, I mean, in the meantime, reach out to, I'm sure there are women lawyers in Brazil mm -hmm. who would be willing to help and, and step right. up um, and, and reach out to them because what you're doing is amazing, you know, in speaking out. But you're right, being, you have to also be smart about it. Right. I want to get the um, brave gentleman behind you and we can wrap up with uh, um, one last question. Hello, uh, my name is Joseph. Um, First of all, thank you guys uh, for being here today. Um, everything that has been talked about is really inspiring and helpful. Um, I just wanted to say that I feel that the Me Too movement has helped me reclaim my voice, mm -hmm. that I am, I am on the path to reclaiming my voice and what it once was. Um, when I was in high school, I reported two men who were in positions of power that eventually were removed from their positions of power. One was a teacher at my school, and the other one was my boss. Uh, they were sexually harassing people and behaving very inappropriately. Um, and it's just, I'm sorry, I'm speaking slowly just because it's, it's kind of emotional. Um, I feel kind of dumb, or I felt really dumb entering my adult life because when those things started happening, it wasn't as easy as when I was a kid. I felt like um, when I was in high school, adults were more willing to listen. Um, but now with everything that's been happening, I, I don't know, I just feel a lot more optimistic. Um, but yeah, I, I have my sights set on man number three because of the Me Too movement. He is a man who works in the media. And yeah, I, I just really want, from the bottom of my heart, I wanted to say thank you That you, you have seen a, someone else being abused and want to step in and help. Is that yes. It? Yeah. Yes. I've, this man has put people's lives in danger, and he needs to be reported. It is um, am amazing that you're doing that, and we were, we've been talking about this earlier. And I don't know if others want to jump in, but how important it is um, for your own sense of self worth and our own sense of self worth that we do something when we see abuse taking place, and also to support. Journey, you were yeah. um, so articulate about this. You know, we've been talking a lot about um, the roles we all play as bystanders. So even when we are, you know, maybe not a victim or, or survivor or in instances that we are, you know, when we witness something that happens to s someone else, what can we do to be their voice for them? So I applaud you and tell you how brave you are and thank you for being such an ally, for speaking up, and, and, you know, being courageous enough to, to say it's not okay. 
because this happens all the time in the workforce where people witness abuse, they witness harassment, and we don't do anything about it, but it's going to take all of us participating in this movement. Every single person, whether you are a victim of it or whether you are a bystander, I applaud you for having the courage to report it because it takes so much to use your voice. But you know, I always think of this quote, Alice Walker said, the most common way people give their power away is by thinking they don't have any. So I would encourage you and all of us to just own our power and realize we have the power just by taking the steps and using your voice. So I thank you. Thank you so much for, for being such an amazing ally. Agreed. Thank you. That's such a lovely way to end this session. Thank you all for coming. Thanks to my esteemed um, gal pals here. And uh, timesupnow.com and the National Women's Law Center.com for more information. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you.